Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be in God's house this morning, isn't it? I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 17 or your Bible app, or you can follow along on the screen. The words will be there. Uh, I'll be reading from the New King James Version this morning. The title of the message is Giving Thanks as we celebrate the Thanksgiving holiday later this week. And this is what the pilgrims did, right? They gave thanks. Sometimes we don't think much about it. We just think of Thanksgiving as, as one word, and it's a holiday that we get off of work, or we get together with family and friends, and we eat way too much, and we watch football. Well, some of us do. <laughs> but it, really, the word comes from two words together, thanks and giving, or you can inter interchange those and say giving thanks. We often say, let's give thanks at mealtime. You might not even know where it came from. It's nowhere in the Bible until we get to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where we hear Jesus using those words. Whenever he broke bread, the Bible says that he gave thanks. So it came from Jesus himself, and he was teaching us that even daily provision is from God. It's all from God, our Father. And we should live a life of thanksgiving. And not just on a holiday called Thanksgiving, but every day. We should live a life of gratitude. So we're going to look at today's text. And I'm going to be again in Luke chapter 17, beginning with verse 11. And now it happened on his way to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. Now they had to stand afar off because it was actually a law. If they had leprosy. You had to stay away. And then they lifted up, the, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourself to the priest. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, I just pray for these next few moments, God, that you would just, we would give you our full attention. God, help us to block out everything that tries to steal it away. I ask that right now that each of us would just open up our hearts and our minds for what you have to say to us today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to share three lessons from you out of this text that we just read. And if we truly love God and want to worship Him, then the first one of these is this. Worship is giving thanks. Worship is giving thanks. If you want a definition, a simple definition of worship, it's worship is giving thanks. Verses 15 and 16, again, of our text today, it says this, one of them, when he saw he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. Worship is all about thanking someone after you've received something. Worship is when you receive something from God and you want to express your love for him and give him thanks. Now please hear me when I say this. True, genuine love is always expressed. You might have grown up in a family that didn't express love, but you're in a different family now. Just look around. You might have had a dysfunctional father, but you have a good, good father now. And you can express your love to God because you've received something from Him. Just think about it. Love always has to be expressed. 
Think, think about the first time you held your hand, held hands with that someone special. You were expressing what you were feeling in your heart. You were expressing love. And this is all throughout Scripture. Now, I'm not trying to get everyone to express love or worship God in the same way. I realize we all have just different personalities. But worship is giving thanks. In the Old Testament, there are 11 Hebrew words for the word praise. But there are seven of them that are the most dominant, the main ones. So I'm going to share these seven words with you today, and we're going to look for the word thanksgiving in their definition. The first one is this. Toda. Toda means a thanksgiving choir. A thanksgiving choir. And again, not the holiday, but a choir that's giving thanks. The second word is this. Barak. It means to kneel in thanksgiving or to bow down, often just bow. The third one is Tehillah, to sing a song of thanksgiving. Now make sure you don't pronounce this one wrong. It's not tequila. That might make you sing a different kind of a song. But okay, so we have Tehillah. The fourth one is Hala. Hala. It means to give thanks by being clamorously foolish. Clamorously foolish. And by the way, this is where we get our word hallelujah. The fifth one is yada. Yada means to give thanks with extended hands or to lift your hands in thanksgiving. Notice, are you seeing the pattern here? It's all about, all these words are about thanksgiving. The sixth one is zamar. Zamar means to give thanks with a musical instrument. And the seventh one is Shabbat, which is to give thanks in a loud tone or shout, as in shout to the Lord. But here's the thing. Notice that it's all about expressing love. It's all about giving thanks. And hear me, you will never be a worshiper if you're not grateful. You will never be a worshiper if you're not grateful. Gratitude is what worship, causes worship to come out. And by the way, there's a verse in the Bible that has four of the seven of these words in one verse. And I'll read it to you. Psalm 100 verse 4 says this, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. This verse uses the word toda, which means the Thanksgiving choir, tehila, singing praise, yada, which means to extend your hands to him, and barak, which means to bow before his name. So here, let me put the definitions in the verse and read it again. Enter into his gates with a Thanksgiving choir and into his courts with singing praises. Extend your hands to him and bow before his name. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? These are scriptural expressions of worship. Bowing is in the Bible. Shouting is in the Bible. Clapping is in the Bible. Extending your hands and lifting them up is not a Pentecostal thing. It's a Bible thing. And it's perfectly okay if you do that here. I'll just tell you that. If you feel like worshiping and raising your hands, it's okay to do that. So worship is giving thanks. If we want to worship God, we need to give him thanks, which is gratitude. Which is gratitude. Let's look again at verse 15. Hmm? Okay. All right, but there is something, is there something that causes gratitude? Is there something that causes gratitude? Let's look at the second point. Miracles precede gratitude. 
Miracles precede gratitude. Let's look at verse 15 again. It says this, And one of them, when he saw he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God. When he saw that he was healed. In other words, the reason he was grateful because he had just received a miracle from God. You say thank you after you received something. That's what worship is. It's just saying thank you. When we come together, come together, we give thanks. When we get up in the morning, we give thanks and thank him for a new day. It's just giving thanks. And this guy did it with a loud voice and fell down on his face at the feet of Jesus. Now, a question for you. Do you think that was appropriate? Do you think it was appropriate that he fell down before Jesus? I think it was. See, we don't know a lot about leprosy. Leprosy is a disease. In its essence, is an, it, it's an autoimmune disease. It's a bacteria that causes your flesh to, fl to eat away at itself. If you had leprosy in the Bible times, you could not associate with anyone else because it was thought to be contagious. And it is somewhat contagious, but not as contagious as they, as they thought for many, many years. When you had leprosy, you had to live in a leper colony. You had to live with other lepers. You couldn't be a productive member of society. You couldn't hold a job, you couldn't have a career, you couldn't go to church, and you couldn't live with your family. If you contracted leprosy after you had children, you could never go to any of your kids' games. You couldn't kiss your wife goodnight. And if anyone ever got too close to you, you had to yell out, unclean, unclean. So not only were you a physical outcast, but you were a social and religious outcast as well. Because they believed that the reason you had the disease was some kind of a judgment from God. People didn't want to get anywhere around you. So this man had leprosy. He had no hope. And Jesus healed him. So I want to ask you again, was it appropriate that he fell down on his face with a loud voice and gave thanks? Yep, of course it was. So if you had a disease and Jesus healed you, would it be appropriate for you when we come together to express your thanks? Hmm. Weren't we all healed of a disease called sin? and the wages of sin is death. We deserve to die. And God allowed a way for us not to have to pay that penalty. So it's okay if you want to express your love to God at any time, including being here. It's completely appropriate. Okay, so gratitude is worship. Worship is about being grateful. Gratitude comes from miracles. So all of this works in a process. So is there something that can actually cause a miracle? Wouldn't that be cool? If something can spark a miracle in our life, wouldn't that be cool? Well, let me show you point number three. Obedience precedes miracles. Obedience precedes miracles. Now, I'm not saying that we earn them. We don't do that. But just look in this verse, verse 14. So when he, Jesus, saw them, he said to them, go show yourself to the priest. And so it was, as they went, they were cleansed. They weren't cleansed when Jesus spoke. Nope. They were cleansed when they obeyed. And as they did, as they went to show themselves to the priest, they were on their way and they were healed. Now, they could have said this, we're not healed yet. And the law says that we have to first be healed before we go show ourselves to the priest. We're not healed yet. 
Because Jesus didn't say, hey, go show yourself to the priest and you will be healed. He didn't say that. He just, <laughs> excuse me, he just said, go show yourself to the priest. And as they obeyed, then they were healed. Do you realize how much of a pattern this is in the Bible? It's all throughout the Bible. You can watch for it when you're reading. Standing at the front of the Red Sea, God says to Moses, Lift, lift up your rod and you will see a miracle, the parting of the Red Sea. Now Moses could have said, <laughs> the enemy's right there, God. We, we need to hurry this up. No, God just would have said, uh-huh, lift up your rod. Do what I told you to do. When they got to the Jordan River and they had to cross the Jordan to get into the Promised Land, God said, have the priests put their feet in the water. Now we have to realize that the river was at flood stage at this time. And we don't think much about this, but we've seen it on the news, right? When there's a flood and a river is overflowing. We've seen cars carried away downstream at flood stage. The river was at flood stage. And God said, put your feet in the water now they could have said, remember the Red Sea? I'm pretty sure we could probably find that stick again. And we could hold that up. And God, if you'll stop the water, we'll walk through again. And he said, no. Put your feet in the water. And then I'll stop the water. Again, this pattern is all throughout Scripture. The crowd said to Jesus, come down off that cross and we will see and believe. And Jesus said, believe, and you'll see. It's backwards. Is it possible that God is telling you to do something that you're not doing that could re release a miracle in your life, which would release gratitude, which would release worship? Is it possible? We'll come back to that later. Now, it's important that when we read the Bible that we understand the context from which we're reading. So we're going to back up, and I'm going to show you the context before verse 11. I'm going to show you the first 10 verses. And I didn't put all of those in the, the bulletin today so you could have room to write notes, okay? What's amazing about this is most people have never connected the first 10 verses of, the, of that chapter to our story today, to the 10 lepers. <coughs> Excuse me. And then most people read those first 10 verses and they divide the first five verses from the second five verses. And we'll, talk, we'll show you that. But when we look at this, you'll see how the whole chapter fits together. So in this text, the first 10 verses, Jesus is going to first talk about offenses, then he's going to talk about the offender, and then he's going to talk to, to the offended. So let's take a look. Luke 17, starting in verse 1. And then he said to the disciples, It is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of those little ones, these little ones. Take heed yourself. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. All right, now before we go into this next part, watch this. I'm telling you, most of you have probably not caught this before. Remember the disciples said, increase our faith? Okay, here's how I think the conversation went down with Jesus. Hey, listen, guys. People are going to offend you. But when they do, I want you to forgive them, okay? Do you understand? When people offend you, you forgive them. The disciples are like, oh, okay. 
Yeah, we can do that. And Jesus says, oh, no, 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 I'm not done. I'm not done. If the same guy does the same thing seven times on the same day, then you still forgive him. They're like, oh, hmm. Okay, I think we're going to need a little more faith for that. Uh -huh. Do you see it? Most people don't think much about the statement, increase our faith. Jesus says, if someone sins against you, forgive him. Okay. But if it's the same guy, the same day, the same thing, seven times, you still forgive him. And they said, yeah, we're going to need a little more faith for that. Now watch his response in verse 6. Continue. So the Lord said, if you had faith as a mustard seed, in other, in other words, just a little bit of faith, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. And which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he comes in from the field, come at once and sit down and eat? But would he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me until I've eaten and drunk and afterwards you will eat and drink? Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded, not suggested, but commanded him? I think not. So likewise you, when you've done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We've done what, what was our duty to do. Now think about this. Jesus says you need to forgive people. You just need to forgive them. And they said, uh, yeah, we're going to need more faith for that. But here's what he said. You don't need more faith. You just need to do what you're told. I think that's what he said. I know that's strong, but hey, I didn't make up the Bible. This is, this is written, this is the Bible. So listen to that. They said, we're going to need more faith for that. And he comes right back and says, <clears throat> does a servant get thanked because he did what was commanded him to do? That's why he tells that story. And then he says this, kind of like Jesus has a little attitude every once in a while. He says, I think not. I think not. So here's what he said. You need to do what you're told. I'm the Lord. I told you to forgive. And you don't need more faith to forgive people. You just need to obey. You need to do what you're told, and I told you to forgive. So then he's walking along, and ten lepers show up. See, this is our story. And, he's, and they say, have mercy on us. And I think Jesus kind of looked at the disciples and said, okay, just watch and see what happens when you obey. Go show yourself to the priest. And as they went, as they obeyed, they were cleansed. It's not the text, but I think Jesus was kind of like, see? See what happens when you obey? Good things happen when you obey, when you do what you're told. Are you following this? Now, I'm not coming back to miracles. Now, I'm not saying if you're waiting for a miracle that you're in sin or you're doing something wrong. Not at all. We live in a fallen world. I've been there in my own life where I was asking for a miracle and it wasn't happening. But when the miracle does, ha when it hasn't happened yet, we need to ask God, what are you telling me to do? What are you telling me to do? Because if I obey what Jesus tells me to do, I'll see miracles. Now the miracle might not come exactly as I expected, right? We might need to take a look at what happens. But when I see miracles happen in my life, I'll have an attitude of gratitude. And when I have an attitude of gratitude, I'll give thanks to the Lord. Because that's the pattern. So we talked about this leper. Let's think about this 30 years later. So Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest. 
the guy is healed and comes back with a loud voice and falls on his face and glorifies God. He gives thanks. Now let's bring up this to the modern, to a, to the modern day. Let's say the guy lives here in the Denver area. And 30 years ago, he was cured of an incurable disease by Jesus. And at the time, he doesn't, he doesn't give him thanks. He goes back to college and gets his degree. He goes, gets himself a good wife and has, a, has some good kids. And the kids go find their spouses and they start having grandkids. The, the guy's doing great. 30 years later, have gone, 30 years have gone by since he was healed. And one day he's walking down the street and he meets Jesus. Would it still appropriate at that time to run up to him and fall on his face and say thank you? Would it still be appropriate then? Absolutely. Absolutely it would. All of us have something to be grateful for. God has done miracles in each of our lives. He gave you life. He gave you his grace and love. He gave you the gifts of forgiveness of your sins and eternal life. He brought you here this morning, and I'm grateful for that. I encourage you, even if it's been 30 years ago, <coughs> 30 years ago since you accepted Christ into your life, to stop and count your blessings, just like the old hymn says, count your blessings. Think about what God has done for you. Oh, yeah, there. You can see that. I should have put that on the screen. But obedience leads to gratitude, giving thanks. Count your blessings and give him thanks. Give God thanks. We have much more to be thankful for than we do not. <coughs> Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we do have so much to be grateful for. No matter our circumstances, God, you have given us life on this earth and an opportunity for each everlasting life in heaven with you because of Jesus. So, Lord, help us to focus on what we have to be thankful for. Make us a grateful people. Help us, Father, to give thanks to you today and every day. In Jesus' name, amen.